As we continue to tell the story of the conservation work at Zambezi Delta Safaris in Mozambique, Tyler and I had the opportunity to spend a morning with the anti-poaching unit, learning about how they operate and the importance of their presence for successful conservation in the area. That pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to film one on my phone. I'm going to do the same shot again. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to I'm gonna shoot wide on that one. How many... Um, how many poachers do you catch in a month? Sometimes it depends. Yeah. From like, from let us say from May. Yeah. No, let us say from June. Yeah. Up to December. We are not. Not many. It's not that much. Because it's hunting season. Yes. Yeah. And then sometimes there they some seed that they are planting. Mm. They are busy doing the gardens and yeah. stuff. But somewhere from december up to may mm -hmm. it's not that much mm -hmm. sometimes a month a month you can catch two yeah sometimes one yeah it depends the area that they've been poached but yeah all the area we we covered now and now and now they know yeah now they know, now they know that it's and you know i feel like the the community knows now too so they are also looking yeah. out for it right it's because other things that it helped us to get more tricks mm -hmm. for the poacher because to use the one plan, like the old plan, yeah. they get used quickly and then they change yeah, plan. Yeah, they change plan, yeah. So I have to always think about my guys because some of my guys, they can think, but they are not sure they think yeah. it's gonna work or not. Right. But myself, I'm always like, every day in the morning, yeah. I have to come with another plan. Yeah. To say, guys, today we are not working for eight days, we're yeah. working for two days and then go home. Yeah. So that everyone, as they're going home, they know uh, the APU is back home. Yeah. So now let's this is the Into the Wilderness podcast, no, an episode two of okay, a special so, series yeah. brought to you from the field. This is a Modern Huntsman production yeah. presented by the Cabela Family Foundation. We will be hearing more about the anti-poaching operations later in the show, but now we're going to pick up where we left off last time, digging into the nuts and bolts of how large-scale conservation projects, like the Cheetah Relocation, are actually funded. Mark Haldane, operator of the Katada 11 concession, explains how this works in practice. We're very, very fortunate on that side that we've had such fantastic backing because, to be honest with you, these safari operations, they, they're relatively profitable. I mean, you know, I survive, that's my main income. But you couldn't fund as much as we fund with the scientific side, the communities, the anti-poaching, you know, we so we, e even with uh, a safari operation run well, yeah, like like this place is, all of this this kind of cherry on top, all these amazing things that we're seeing. You're saying that you probably wouldn't be able to fund that. You need a bit of help. Okay, I can tell you right now, we budget every year for a hundred thousand dollars from our hunting revenue, and that goes straight back into community and anti poaching, but. It isn't enough to do the whole the whole thing at the level that we're doing it now. No, you can't siphon off enough to do cheetah relocations and Ryan relocations not. and all the yeah. collaring and the yeah. flying and yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah what, what's that been like your relationship with the Cabela Family Foundation? You know, it's been a it's been a great relationship. Um, we've been lucky to have a few good relationships. Theirs being the very best of the whole lot. But I think the amazing thing is is they genuinely, genuinely have an interest in conservation. They're not doing it simply for the propaganda or to say, well, the uh, Cabela's did great out of the hunting for so long, we're putting back. They actually love this, you know. I mean, you look at Mary, she is so passionate about this. Yeah. Um, and they genuinely hands-on. Uh, you know, when we sit down and have the meeting with Dan every night, it's okay, who's going to be on tomorrow? Who's going to be involved in the collaring? And it's it's an absolute cherry for them. So working with people that don't just give you a check and disappear. I mean, I virtually have a conversation of one form or another with Dan once or twice a week. And it's, well, how's this line doing? What's that one up to? Gee, whiskers, we've had more cubs. Or, you know, it's it's just what's going on all the time. And I think we're very privileged to have that relationship with him. Yeah, I got some, I could I could see, I mean, I have some photos of Mary getting out of the helicopter, seeing, especially when we 
collared the first lion cub born yes. here, or yes. that that next generation of lion yeah. cubs, and she she was visibly emotional and, and very is, excited absolutely. about yeah. yeah. She sees them as her babies in a, in a, in a sense. An extension of her does. family, yeah. her absolutely vast family, does. mother, yeah. mother of lions. Yeah. yeah, we have a, a WhatsApp group uh, with Mary on it, and uh, yeah, the, the bent is every second or third day picture of a lion and just arbitrary stuff, you know, right down to the bugs and whatever else. But she's hands on with what goes on here, as is Dan. You're going to hear more on the 24 Lion Reintroduction Project shortly. But this is a snippet of Mary Cabela telling Tyler about the first phase of this journey three years ago, when she transported sedated lions in the back of a plane to Katada 11. So were you here when they originally released the, the, uh-huh. the 24? Yeah, we came yeah. back, yeah. Okay. They were, uh, I was even with them when they were uh, darting them and Okay. They put them on the plane. I was on the plane. You were with on them the and, plane with all the sleeping lions. And they were lions. just laying in the back of the plane. They were, you know, there were six of them in my plane. Yeah. And it was a, quite an experience. The pilot says, I said, well, how do you feel about having these lions in your plane? And he said, as long as they stay asleep, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> do you, you know, spending that much time with them, do you feel like you, you developed an attachment or, or oh, a, yeah. a care for those? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Mary's son, Dan Cabela, is executive director of the Family Foundation. He explained to us how they became involved in these large conservation projects here. Our foundation had been around for, you know, 20 years or so before before we were, you know, we took the company, company public and then we sold it. Um, in the foundation, I, I'd, I had been a board member pretty much from the beginning, um, and I'm now the executive director. But we had always just kind of written checks, you, you know. I mean, we had never really participated in anything. You can, know? I, can I ask you before you carry on there, what was the premise of the foundation initially being set, set up? Because a lot of people will know the Cabela name, but I would imagine around the world a lot of people know Cabela as the store and probably maybe even don't even know that there was a foundation. No, I, I think that's absolutely true. I, I think that uh, the, the foundation was set up to to be able to give back, you know, and, and, and my folks, you know, primarily wanted to give back to the, the things that made them a success, which would be, you know, things that are hunting oriented outdoors, wildlife. Um, and in the early years, in, until really very recently, I mean, we basically, you know, people sent in requests and we reviewed them and we writ, wrote checks, you know, but we never, really did a whole lot so 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 when we were in the process of selling the company i, I mean I, I i went to the board and i was like you know we need to do some things you know where we're involved in it um and we're participating and and really making a difference I'm, that that'll be our new brand um and so when ivan came to me with this project and and, and he said you know you're going to be there you know you're going to you know, participate in the whole thing. And, and uh, I mean, we love that. And, and it's been absolutely incredible. I mean, to be able to put your hands on living lions is a pretty amazing thing. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's hard to describe. I mean, you guys have seen the cheetahs. So, you, so you kind of have that experience now, sure. but, yeah. but the first time it, that I had that experience, it, it, it uh, was somewhat overwhelming really. It didn't take long for our conversation to come back to the funding of conservation. And Dan is about as good a person as any to take this topic on. After all, the majority of funding for both the lion and cheetah reintroduction came from his family foundation. One of the the arguments that you see banded around when people are talking about well, how do we f- facilitate conservation is, well, the economics shouldn't matter. We should protect these areas and we should protect these species because we just should. It should be intrinsic in in society that we protect these species. It should be sort of beyond the economics of it because that's, that's the argument for not having hunting in an area. It's just, we should find the money to protect these areas and we shouldn't have to kill them to do it. But the problem is by the time we figure that out, it's all going to be gone. Um, I, I mean, it, it, that, that, that's not realistic. I mean, I, I have nothing against photographic safaris and things like that. I mean, I'll actually enjoy them, but, but, but how do you, how would you implement that here? 
How would you implement that in, a, in, in a, Ethiopia? Yeah. Mm -hmm. In a floodplain where you can't drive for half of the yeah. year, there's setsy flies and mosquitoes and wild animals that you cannot get close enough to, even with maybe a five or 600 millimeter lens. Uh, yeah, I mean, you're not gonna get good pictures. It, it doesn't worked. really lend itself to photographic tourism this place. No, I mean, that, that works pretty well. Well, there's a lot of infrastructure. And, and I, I understand those places are loaded with tourists and okay. What does that do? I mean, it, it brings in income. Absolutely, income's important. But what, what about the carbon footprint? Yeah. I mean, you, you know, you, you're saying this is the biggest group of people you've ever seen get off planes to do something like this. We're talking 30 people. Yeah. I mean, go to a photographic safari place. 30 yeah. people is nothing. Yeah. I mean. It's about 500. Yeah. Yeah, or more in the Serengeti. Yeah, yeah. and that's something that, that we've talked about diving into in, in this next issue a little bit is the comparisons of the impacts, not just on the ecosystem, but on resources of a hunting safari versus a photographic safari. And the number of people in the Serengeti, all driving vehicles, all drinking water, all using up electricity, creating trash, all those kinds of things. And, and then ultimately, for anyone and traffic jams taking pictures of lions. It's, it's yeah, crazy, and, isn't and, it? and then the the <laughs> lions and leopards and animals behavior. When it really sunk in for me, I was I was there a couple of years ago, and I saw a leopard hiding behind a Land Cruiser, stalking behind it, and then jumping out and pouncing on a zebra and killing it. And everybody, you know, was taking their pictures, and I'm like. That's not really wild animal behavior. That was a learned behavior from the abundance of tourism. safari vehicles and tourism. And so it's a trade-off, right? I mean, is it still important for people to have those experiences? Sure. Are those animals really even wild anymore? I mean, yeah, but they're highly habituated to this funny parade of safari vehicles with big lenses and funny hats. <laughs> Especially funny hats if you're from Texas. Yeah, I don't call those funny, boy. <laughs> It is well documented by the likes of the IUCN and the WWF that the biggest threat to terrestrial wildlife declines globally is land use change. And that comes down to a trade. How do we value the land around us and what do we want to use it for? Ultimately, that trade comes down to economics, as Ivan Carter explained. The argument that gets thrown is, well, that's fine, but we could also fund it through this mechanism, or you know, or photo tourism is the one that gets thrown up a lot. Is there another way to fund that, and does it really matter? So, so here, in, in particular, here. So, Byron, there's there's only five land uses, only five. Everybody says, no, there's hundreds of ways you can use land. No, there isn't. There's only five. So we can settle on it. So think of the land in between Dallas and Fort Worth. That was at one point prairie. Yeah. And it's been highly modified by people settling on it. We can use it to draw our minerals out of, so we can mine it. We can farm it to grow our food, which is how millions of acres across the planet, and that's highly modified. Not a living thing grows in the soybean field that is there to feed the vegetarian, to look after wildlife. Um, and then you've got tourism in two different ways, photo tourism or hunting tourism. And so they are the only two mechanisms that you can utilize your land without modifying its ecosystem. But both of those have to be done responsibly. So I like to use the word responsible resource use. Are we using our resources responsibly? So we are sitting right now, and you guys can't see it, but we're sitting in, in camp chairs. We're all wearing clothes. These clothes were grown in a cotton field. We've got all kinds of, all of our equipment that's on our heads and whatever is made out of crude oil. We've got, you know, plastic and metal. Everything that is on and around us right now used to at one point be a natural resource. And it's been mined in some cases responsibly or not. But nevertheless, humans cannot live without resources. Wildlife is a resource. Are we utilizing it responsibly is the whole nother question. Is it responsible to build a big fancy lodge, pump a million liters of water out of the water table, create a waterhole in an area where one never used to exist so that your non-hunting tourist can have less impact. That may or may not be responsible. It's not responsible if that leads to modifying that ecosystem by virtue of its impact. And it's exactly the same with hunting. You can say, well, one hunter generates the same amount of money as a you know, 
depends on the landscape. 100, 200, 500 tourists, whatever the number is, it doesn't matter. But he can also have a negative impact if his quota is too high, if he's hunting unsustainably, et cetera, et cetera. So the responsible use of the resource is really a very important part of that conversation. So if you look at the data of the animals populations in this area that are independently measured each year, you see the population going up. How can that happen if we're overhunting it? It wouldn't be going up, they'd be going down. So we take a, almost a thousand animals a year off this landscape. They generate money to feed the landscape. They generate meat to feed the people. And it's done in a way that's responsible enough that the rest of the population carries on growing. Very hard to argue that. Anti-poaching guys just going to pass on, on their bikes. Pass <laughs> on their bikes with AKs on their backs. <laughs> <laughs> what a sight. That's never happened in a podcast yeah, for yeah. another anti-poaching guy oh, on his yeah, motorbike. Another, another AK. <laughs> <laughs> Go get them, boys. While clearly there is support here for hunting in terms of its role in conservation and the money it generates for this endeavor, it is only fair to question the opinion of those scientists and conservationists who don't necessarily have a vested interest in hunting as an activity. So, we put this to conservation biologist Willem Bryers Lowe, the man in charge of monitoring animals across the Zambezi Delta Safari's concession. Clearly you're someone who's impassioned by, by nature, and particularly big cats. That's, that's what you live and breathe every day here. And yet, you're clearly someone, just from the few takeaways of conversation here, who supports the hunting of them. How, how on earth do you match that up? I mean, you spend so much time looking at data points and you know these animals, uh, you, you know that this, this animal lost its cub because a male lion came in. Not that this has happened here yet because there hasn't been any huntings of, of lions, but leopards are hunted here. How, how, how do you make peace with that? So, one one piece of advice that that someone once told me was it's not about the individual it's about the species and i think that's where where the line is drawn for me is if you think about each individual animal and you think Cecil the lion some bad hunter some dentist from the states came and shot this collared lion this is obviously not not the greatest situation but at the end of the day, it's, it's not about the individual animal, it's about the species. And for example, you can lose a, a lion to a collaring event. If you dose the if you have incorrect dosage or you know you dart on a on a very hot day and the lion doesn't wake up, you, you've technically killed killed the lion. And it's 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 through a management tool. And Again, I just I just come back to the, the 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 fact that if you're trying to manage an individual, you are not really doing conservation. You need to manage the species, and so by doing that, you need to manage the population. And so, one form of management, which we've discussed a little bit earlier, is is trophy hunting. And um, unfortunately, there's just such backlash on on trophy hunting at the moment. Um, and and one can understand why because it's not it's not a pretty form of conservation, and um, people sitting at home, uh, I want to say the the armchair conservationists, and you know a lot of people fall into that category, and they can easily make decisions and and you know put bans in place that, say for example banning leopard hunting in in southern Africa or you know in you know Botswana and Namibia or wherever you know various countries what impact that has what what the 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 imp, kind of indirect impacts that had, that has direct and indirect can be significant and uh, there's there's quite a few people that have that have popped up recently that have been um not necessarily advocates for trophy hunting but they understand that it works and what it provides is it provides protection in an area where no one wants to be it's areas that are infested with tsetse flies, no tourist, no no five-star lodge wants to be in an area where there's tsetse flies. Um, there's mosquitoes, there's tons and tons of mosquitoes that will give you malaria. 
You know, a lot of people will die. You know, it's 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 difficult areas. It's not always, um, you know, road networks are usually quite, you know, it's it's hard terrain. It's wet areas like we have here. Um, but those people don't see that. And they're, one other aspect that they don't see is, is the community side. And so with the trophy hunting, what what we've managed to achieve here is, is to build up um, a great relationship with the, with the community based in the area. For conservation to work, community engagement and tangible local benefit are essential, wherever you are in the world. As I have often written in Modern Huntsman, conservation isn't really about wildlife, it's about people. Mark Haldane walks us through their journey of rebuilding the links between local communities and the direct benefits they gain from nature. The anti-poaching is is definitely was definitely the, the turning point for us when we started the anti-poaching. And then once people saw we had a bit of anti-poaching, clients were amazing. They'd come along and say, well, what do you need, you know? For the anti-poaching For the anti-poaching. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll sponsor two motorbikes and I'll sponsor the uniforms. Wow, and okay. it wasn't even an ask. It was like you'd be sitting around the fire and, man, I really I see you, the potential here. So we had a lot of help and it was pretty much – Every other client who came in here would say, "Well, he has a thousand bucks for your anti-poaching. He has Man. five thousand bucks for your anti-poaching." Guys would ask me for these gin traps that they take out. Oh, I'll give you a couple of hundred bucks. We now take a shipment over to Dallas every year and sell, <laughs> and sell them. them. And we get, you know, we ask a thousand bucks for them. Most guys give you double that at least, you know. But as Mark found out, a good anti-poaching unit was only part of the puzzle. We're going to pick that up in a moment, but let's join back up with the anti-poaching team as they show Tyler and I some of the challenges they face every single day. One day I caught one guy, they were like doing some palm wine, mm -hmm. palm wine from the yeah, bush, yeah. but we checked like a week, we didn't find any snakes, yeah. any piece of bones, like, yeah. and then I just asked myself, no one is going to survive into the bush yeah. for like over 10 days drinking palm wine. Yeah. Because from home <laughs> yeah. to to where they are drinking palm wine is like 15 kilometer walking, yeah. but, which is nothing. Yeah. You, you, these guys, they can walk like over 30 kids. Yeah. And then I just think, I said to my guys, let's just try to sweep where they are living. Yeah. Because we find someone sleeping next to the fire. Yeah. He's drunk. Yeah. But other day we went there, we find a piece, a piece of plastic, yeah, hanging out like this. Oh, yeah, like this, the black plastic, like this. Yeah, and then I take the long stick, I dig that plastic. Yeah, you know what they did? They make the small hole, and then they boil the meat, and then they put the meat as they get coming out from the water yeah. and they put the meat into the plastic and then they put it into the hole and then they cover. You find the guy sleeping like this. It's fire, yeah. And yeah. they're sleeping like this. They're sleeping on top of the meat. Okay. So we won't see. You're telling him, stand up. It's not just, there's nothing there. And then you say, ah, it's clear. Yeah. One day, there's no meat. And then as I open it there, there's like, I think it's like two or three back legs wow. of the animals. There. Yeah. Into the, into the sand. Yeah. They just covered. Man, so, that's smart. While we were chatting, the rest of the unit were busy setting up traps to demonstrate how poachers catch game in the bush. The first example was a man-made gin trap, measuring more than two foot long and a foot across at the jaws. It would be buried on a game path, indiscriminately clamping itself around the leg of any animal which passed by. Uh, so now, what I will do, my guy is going to show you how to open the gin trap. Mm -hmm. Because the gin trap is not easy, you can't just put it down like this yeah. and put the feet on top. Yeah. Even you are 10 people, you can't open it. Yeah. So you have to find the dead trees, but they mustn't be like the dry one. They must be like dead trees, but they're still wet. Yeah. And then the one root is going to go inside into the sand. And then uh, one of my guys is going to open a little bit into the side of the, of the, of the, of the root. Yep. So that this tree, yeah. It's gonna get in and then they go right into the into the into the hood and then yeah. they can able to push it down because it's okay. a little bit of supporting yeah. Yeah. The, the, the 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 dead tree. Did any of um 
or or any of the guys did they used to poach and then you converted them? Yeah, some of yeah. the um, is like it's like two guys. Yeah, that we embroing. They were yeah. like a poacher before, yeah. so now we just give them work. Those are the work. best anti poachers. Yeah, <laughs> that's why sometimes we, we we need someone that we've been doing poaching so mm -hmm. that they really helps you to just. Because they know the tricks each and other who was poaching before, which yeah. place they've been poached. Yeah. And then they're just telling you. Just... So do do they make these themselves? Yes. Yeah. Because even you can see, yeah, there's no machine that they're using to weld. Mm -hmm. They just put the spring into the fire and yeah. bend it. Bend it, yeah. And then they've got something like a, um, a old wheel for yeah. the bicycle. Yeah. And then the moment came to set off the gin trap, which had been buried and covered with a thin layer of soil. Man, that's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you think that breaks your leg? Yeah, like those reed parts and stuff. Yeah. If maybe they hit them mm -hmm. like straight with the teeth, teeth yeah. to teeth, then maybe it's going to break. Yeah. But even sometimes if they're hitting him with those yeah. uh, uh, metal things, it's going to break. Yeah, yeah. Because it's going to start like forcing to jump. Yeah, yeah. And then it's going to snap. Yeah. But <clears throat> the anti poaching was the turning point. But I think as, as a as a young man, a relatively young man, I figured I could stop it all with a, with a fist of iron, which I tried, but it didn't work. It worked to a point, but we didn't have the, the, the local community behind us. We were actually at loggerheads with the local community because they basically farmed subs subsistently and this was a meat factory for them. Everyone denied it, but that's, that's fact what happened, you know. So, um, you know, a lot of people said to me, hey, you need to get your community relations up. And I guess I thought about it more and more. And slowly, we, uh, we worked over to that side. And uh, it actually, the, the response was really, really great. The first thing we did was we started doing a meat drop. And I pulled all my staff in, who historically got all the meat that we didn't use. And I said, look, guys, we have to come up with a system here where the local community gets some into. No, 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 they don't work here. What do they need meat for? I said, no, it's, it's, I'm not asking you guys. I'm telling you guys. You know, that's how it's going to work. So finally, they agreed after much backwards and forth that the community would get all the buffalo. And in those days, we, we had an elephant on quota too. So all the buffalo meat, any elephant meat, and the hippo meat, all the plains game animals, go to my own staff. Obviously, we take what we need for the kitchen, for our camp, for the balance, and that's how we've done it. So we weigh all the meat um, that we distribute, um, including what goes to our staff, because they're all part of the community. And on average, in a normal year, we average 31 tons of meat. So if you put it back into meat terms, every household will get about 10 pounds of meat every week. Point. I said to the guys, look, if we're giving you guys meat and I catch a poacher from your village, then you lose your meat drop for three months. Okay. And uh, they agreed. No problem. And we did catch a couple of guys and they did lose their meat drop and there was lots of whining. And that must have pissed off the people who weren't poaching did, within the, yeah. in the village. So you had that, that yeah. peer community pressure to yeah. behave. So that started and, and all of a sudden I saw the community now being more positive towards us. Then I said to them, okay, guys, it's a slow walk. We're only just getting this operation. What do you guys need? Now, we badly need a, a, a mill for our corn. Mm -hmm. So that was the first. I don't know when we did it. It was probably around 15 years ago. What uh, we just saw today. The one you saw today. Okay. Still the same original mill. I think we're in the really? fourth or fifth engine that's gone okay. through there. But it seems like a silly little thing. But if you consider that every bit of corn and, and cassava they eat is ground in a bowl physically by the woman. So that's a huge time saver it's for them. It's a huge time saver for them, yeah. So we started with that. Then we went to the meat. Um, then one of my great old clients called Lewis Corbel passed away. And uh, his, his, uh, the lady that headed up his businesses, a very wealthy man, Carolyn Huckabee, said, um, 
once he passed away, she'd like to do something because he gained so much out of coming here. So she came to us and said, let's build a school. I'll supply all the materials. You guys, you guys do the management and the labor and the logistics of getting it built. So that was the next step. We built a three-classroom school, headmaster's office, and three teachers' houses. And then we bought the, built the chief a house. So slowly, the community was starting to feel the benefits of being involved with us. Since then, we've gone on. We, we had the community fishing program. They weren't allowed to fish in the concession. And I said, you know what? It's ridiculous. We have this huge um, uh, area on the delta which you can't overfish because of the nature of it. It's covered with papyrus. So it's just too difficult to overfish. It's too it. difficult to, but all the little holes all in the edge in that. Yeah. So you couldn't exploit it and, and just finish all the catfish. But if you fish all the little holes in the edge, so I brought in a rule, no netting. Um, so it was all just big fish. And we now issue a license. Um, don't know if any of you guys have flown over fishermen. If you have, then first thing they do is they pick up their... Yeah. Oh, is that what they license. were? Yeah, we did. Yes. And I didn't know yeah. what they were doing. Yeah. Oh, ah, okay. It's actually a cattle ear tag with okay. a number written on it. And I change the color every year. Okay. And it comes with a string and they hang it around their neck. And we'll tell them where they can fish based on where the lions are okay. and also where we don't want any pressure. And, and um, so the fishing worked well. We facilitated too. If a group of 10 go and fish, uh, we'll send a tractor and trailer to go and fetch them. And they'll come back with a ton of fish. Wow. I mean, it's proper. You know, they smoke it all. They bring it back. Some of it they sell. Some of it they eat themselves. Um, so that was the start. Then we went on to the beekeeping, which is a relatively new project now. Yeah, how did that, how did that come to, to being? I've kept bees since I was probably 12 years old. Uh, I've always been fascinated. So you had your own bees. personal mm. fascination in it. Okay. And then I had a, uh, I had a, a commercial operation in South Africa for a lot of years which when I got too busy, I, I sold in the end. Um, and when I came here, I had a dozen beehives around camp, primarily just to give camps honey. And, uh, and I saw all the guys were interested in them. So that, and they, and it, wasn't, it wasn't me who invented the Community Honey Project. It's been going great in Zambia, Tanzania. So I figured it's a good idea here too. So that's where it started. And it's been a little rough. Uh, uh, I'm not going to lie to you, last year, um, we had a, a great honey crop and we left it in the boxes too long and the bees ate half, yeah. half of the honey because we didn't time it correctly. Mm -hmm. um, also, a gang of uh, six members of our village took it upon themselves to raid all their, their uh, village mates' hives and steal the honey. So they went through probably 100 beehives and cleaned all the honey oh, wow. in a very short period. Um, of course, hacked. They didn't understand how the frames worked and the extractor, the centrifugal. So they just absolutely butchered it all. But the community caught them. They took them to the police. They charged them. And the guys got, I think, 18 months prison time. Hmm. So hopefully that's, you know, I said, guys, I can't do this unless you can help yourselves here too. So that's been a positive one. So, so what have you been facilitating? Is it the hives themselves? The hives and themselves. The um, and I have a, a group of guys that are sent off to get trained. Um, some guys from the community, two guys that are permanent on my staff. One is that chap who was with us today, Zachariah, and they do they do the, the, the harvesting every year. When they harvest your honey, it's weighed right then and there with you present, and you are then paid for your honey. And so about, you buy it off them? I buy it off them. Okay. And at the moment, we're utilizing majority here. Mm. It's one, good. I've tried yeah. it. Yeah, it's very good. Yeah, one of the hotels in um, in the archipelago of Villanculos is uh, – is using it as well. In the long run, we hope for a, an export market. So the next thing, we'll have to f raise a bit of money and build a, a world-class honey extraction facility, and then we'll take it from there. Everything we had seen in person pointed towards a conservation model which had managed to balance the needs of people with the desire for broader conservation. But there were some questions still to be answered, which Tyler began to dig into with Ivan. You know, I think that at least in our experience, having conversations with a lot of, let's say, Westerners who aren't familiar with how hunting works in Africa, that one of the biggest obstacles or pain points or misunderstandings is 
you know, that, that local villages or local communities are, are being either taken advantage of or marginalized uh, for people's own gain. And so maybe touch on the, the absolute critical imperativeness of working with the community. Um, otherwise, it, it doesn't work. So here's, here's a great quote to enlarge on that, Tyler, is that you cannot, you cannot solve a third world problem with a first world solution. And so discussing conservation around a boardroom in New York or Chicago, you're not discussing conservation. You're discussing the funding of conservation. If you really want to discuss conservation, you need to go and sit under the mango tree with a community that lives with conservation and try to turn them into conservationists through beneficiation programs, through education, through health programs. Because if your community is not your partner, you cannot succeed. There's not, you know... There's not enough money in the world to protect this just with guns and game scouts. If your community is on sides, your guns and your game scouts become a, a component, but it's not the most crucial component. By far the most crucial component is your community engagement, your community buy-in, and the benefit programs where they can directly see a benefit. And so do they really care about the wildlife? Everybody wants to think so, but I can tell you right now they don't because they care about tomorrow's livelihood. So most of the people listening to this podcast can never think of a single day where there wasn't something to eat in their house, even if it's just a tin of spam. We've always got something to eat. We're talking about communities where day after day, there is nothing to eat. And so if you live there, you don't have time to look at the beauty of an animal. You look at its food value. You know, a Appreciating the beauty of a wild animal is a concept that can only be understood by someone with a full belly. And that statement encapsulates the often forgotten privileged view of Western conservation ideals. Community is clearly at the foundation of success here. We're going to hear more about that from Mark. But before Vincent van der Merwe left camp, I wanted to ask him about the cheetah release plan and also put to him the same difficult question I'd asked conservation biologist Willem. As the meta population manager for the Endangered Wildlife Trust, how did he feel about hunting as a conservation tool? So we're going to keep them in this boma for about another, let's say, three, four weeks just break their homing instinct to ensure that they don't want to return back to South Africa, get them habituated to the area. The uh, lo uh, resident carnivores will come and visit them at the Boma, lion, uh, hyena, leopard. And um, then around about uh, three, four weeks from now, we'll open the gates and off they go and um, they have to survive. Uh, so they obviously lose a little bit of fitness and condition in the Boma. But, you know, cheetah are quite, we, we've realized it's not a major problem. You know, they, they, we all know that, uh, you know, these cheetah are wild functional animals. They, they come from a wild environment, even though it's fenced in South Africa. They're all capable hunters. So it's up to them to go out there and to, number one, avoid competing predators. And number two, catch their own food. That's pretty much a cheetah's life. That's going to be exciting. And they're all collared. All collared with satellite collars, so we'll be able to see, you know, where they're moving on a, a daily basis and to monitor them and to track them. Uh, we've got a wonderful team here at Maromeo with helicopters, uh, so the monitoring's actually done from the air because the landscape's so um, difficult to traverse. And uh, we'll keep an eye on them, closely monitor them for, for, for about... Um, yeah, for the next year at least. Uh, and then in the long run, you know, we'll have to do genetic top-ups uh, just to prevent uh, inbreeding. So yeah. you'll, ha you'll have to bring in new animals. Yes. Now, we have we make peace with the fact that of the 11 cheetah that we have in the Boma here, um, over the next year, we'll probably lose five, six individuals. Many uh, is that? Yeah. Wow. Gin traps, uh, competing predators, lion, leopard. Uh, but our hope is that one or hopefully two females will will reproduce and uh, once a, a, a you know ch ch what we've realized managing cheetah populations is is that they are reliant on a small number of fit and fertile females that produce a remarkable that successfully raise a lot of cubs to independence okay so you need just one of those females in a system like that and she will raise 13 14 uh, cubs to independence yep. and she will she will populate this area so success to us in Gorongosa will be, in 50 years, we'll have 120 cheetahs, yeah. 
it feels like it can feel like for, to the outside world. Well, how how can you be so um, strongly driven by the conservation of something like big cats, but be happy for someone to go and kill a leopard, for example? Yes, it's a tough one. I mean, the the simple answer to that is that you remove the hunters from the equation here, you knock the leopards out completely. So it's a trade. Exactly. You'd rather have a little bit of hunting than no hunting at all. Because once you remove the hunters from here, you remove any form of revenue from coming in here, you remove any form of employment for the local communities here, you remove their source of meat. Uh, their stable meat supply. Um, so leopards wouldn't be tolerated, cheetahs wouldn't be tolerated, lions wouldn't be tolerated. Absolutely not, because the people would move their livestock in here and they, there would be retaliatory killings in the form of carcass poisoning. So it's very easy to eradicate uh, leopards from an area like this. Um, the livestock farmers will come in, uh, the leopards will obviously come into conflict with these farmers and they will bait a carcass with a poison and they'd wipe two or three leopards out in the process. It's very simple to remove leopards from this ecosystem. Whereas the hunters have a vested interest in a leopard population here because that represents a form of revenue to them. Yeah, and they want harvestable surplus. Exactly. And they have no interest in harvest un harvesting unsustainably because that would kill the income stream. Tyler and I asked if we could visit the local community to see for ourselves some of the things that Mark and the others had described. After seeing the beehive and milling machine, we stopped into the community clinic before visiting the new farm. Yeah, so we just wanted to know a little bit more. I mean, obviously we know that this has been possible through you guys, but we just want to hear a little bit more about what's okay. actually treated here versus a main hospital. Right. Okay, so basically if you have a major thing like a broken limb, or you'll, you'll go to the main hospital. Yeah. But all, all the minor um, ailments and... Funny enough, malaria is considered as a minor ailment, yet so it's so common. Um, malaria, as you guys all know, is fatal if left untreated. Mm -hmm. But if it's treated early on, it's actually relatively easy to cure. So by having a clinic right here in the middle of our village, you wake up in the morning, you've got the malaria symptoms, you come straight here. Mm -hmm. By the next day, you're back at work again. Okay, okay. How, how many people for malaria? For malaria in month or by day? <laughs> by, by, by month? By month, um, 1,000. 1,000? 1, yes. Wow. 1,000, 19. Okay. okay. Some, sometimes. So malaria is definitely one of our main ones. The, the um, immunization of all the kids takes place here. Um, the treatment of, um, uh, also the uh, preventative of elephantitis um, is an annual type of uh, flushing out of your system. They come here for that. And any of the other minor ailments, and also all the pregnant ladies come in for their checkups. Um, occasionally the odd baby is delivered here as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, it's the center of health care, of basic health care for our community. So are these, are these all patients? Um, tell me a little bit more about the, uh, the, the community farm that we were at, at today. Okay. Um, I put the drone up in the air so I could get a, an, idea an idea of the scale there. Yeah. In comparison to the, the very small scale plots that you see growing yes. beside all of the, the houses yeah. al along that along that one road, that it that's more it's not, not industrial makes it sound bigger than it yes. is, but it is uh, it's more it, commercial sort exactly, of yeah, yeah, it's got a commercial feel yeah. to it. How did that come about and why was it important to facilitate that? Um, so what happened was we had villages scattered throughout this area. Um, legally, if you go and read uh, the law, there are not meant to be any people inside these katadas, oh, these really? safari areas. Yeah, huh. but it's way too political. Now, no one would ever come here and say, "Out you go," you know. And besides, these are guys just trying to, just trying to live, you know. And they were probably always here. Like and they were always here when I got you. They were here. Yeah. They gravitated back a bit after the war, but according to the chief, nobody who didn't live here ever came back. Um, and also, most of the chaps here would rather live in the village than out here. You know, they kind of see these guys as second-rate citizens a little. So it's a hard way to live well, out th here. These small villages that yeah. are out here. Yeah. Huh. So all of our more successful staff who've been with for a while, first thing they do is buy a house in the village. Hmm. And, and that'll be home for them rather than out here in the bush. You know. hmm. And so how far away is that? It's about a two-and-a-half-hour drive from okay. here. Yeah. So... Uh, 
these little villages were scattered around here, and they were certainly still bush bush meat factories. You know, they were they were definitely harvesting meat whenever whenever we we didn't have our finger on them, they were up to mischief. So we got a really progressive thinking administrator who lives in Maramea, which is the closest village, but she has a big interest in what goes on all around and a genuine interest um, on, on our side and on the people's side. I mean, it's not like she, she's not a compassionate lady, but she wants to see progress in her area. So I went to her and I said, look, um, ma'am, this is not, is not working. Ultimately, th these concessions are owned by the government. We lease them. The game is owned by the, the government. We pay a license for every animal that we harvest. So here. you're a caretaker here. We're a caretaker here. Yeah. We get a long lease. We get 15 years. We've just applied for 25 based on our on, our, on the model and what we've achieved. We don't have the answer, but I, I, we'll get 20, I'm sure. I said to her, so I educated her on the whole system. And also our local community gets 20% back on all the fees we pay government, which is the, the hunting tickets for each animal, a, a license, as you guys call them, and also we pay a lease on the block. 20% goes back to the local community. Does that go back from government? Do they from feed government, it in? yeah. Okay. We have to facilitate it a little bit. We have to help them form committees, set up bank accounts. Okay. And it works pretty well. Every now and then someone gets their fingers in the till, but typically it runs pretty well. And they'll do, make a community decision of what to do what to do with the funds. Some years they split it amongst every household. Some years, one year they bought a whole lot of corn and it arrived here and everyone got corn on a dry year. Okay. But it, it works pretty well. So I told her, this is a win-win. The better this block is, the, 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 the bigger the quotas I can take here, the more benefit for the community. She said, well, it's absolutely a no-brainer. We need to move these people. So she came here with me. We had a meeting with everybody. And said, look, guys, we, we can't afford to move everyone in one year because obviously you must be compensated for your crops. Um, you might have permanent things like mango trees and, you know, a, a little house. As, as rudimentary as it may seem to us, it's home for these guys and has some value. So she said, okay, let's start with this village. She brought in the agricultural department. They valued his fields and his house and came up with a value. And we and we started moving them. And the guys were very, very willing. There wasn't one person who stood up and said, you guys are pushing me off my, my ground. It was positive. You know, they, they felt it was fair. We paid them out, and we also gave them another option, which was the, the Zambezi Delta Farm. We said, if you move, we'll give you a piece of ground in there. <clears throat> very soon, the other villages remaining, the last ones I moved last year, um, and they were like champing at the bit, hey, we, we want to move now, you know, you, you promised, you know. I said, guys, I don't have any income this year, but please, you know, we need to move, you know. And this is because life is better it's in better. the new location. It is better. You, you have the school right near you, you have the clinic right near you, and you have a farm. The first year these guys were looked at and they thought, mm, we don't know about this big scale rice farm. No one's burning anything. And this fertilizer, you know, no one really believed it. And when they saw the crops, I only had 20 people participate the first year. Uh, every year it's more and more. So all these families, some of them chose to just take their money and move out of our whole area, which which was positive for me, I'm not going to lie. But majority of them moved into that area where that farm is. Um, <clears throat> they each got two and a half acres, uh, the guys that chose to take it up. And they got anywhere from about 30 to 60 bags of rice. Of, of 120 pound bags of rice, and that goes an awfully long way to 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 uh, to survive. So that's where it started, and it's been so successful that last year in that village area, which is right near my border, uh, we've put a cut line around. All agreed, it won't expand out. Um, we expanded the project to a second pan like that, um, and we've got more and more people involved. So. Uh, on the plus side, it's creating food for people that need food to survive, taking more of the pressure off the bushmeat trade. Um, and the second very important thing is it's as important for us to save the, uh, the environment here as it is uh, to, to save the wildlife. Uh, you know, as some clever guy said once, if you're a true conservationist, you, you conserve the soil and water first, then the flora, then the fauna. 
And if you do it the other way around, you stand to lose the whole lot. So what was happening here is our local community practiced the slash and burn practice. Which is so common yeah. very across common. the world, and, actually. And to be honest with you, very successful. I mean, they not for the environment, for the guys trying to produce food. They slash and burn it. They put one crop in. They get a fantastic crop out of it. Next year, they don't, they, it doesn't, they don't even use it. They move on to the next one. So every year, each family was probably clearing five acres of, of uh, relatively low productivity ground, using it once and moving on. And, of course, it was devastating. That area where the village is now that you drove through with us today, that was originally pristine forest, that whole area. And look at it now. I mean, it's pretty much open, you know. So that was what my deal with them was you guys have got to stop practicing slash and burn. And they said, no, that's fine, but they do need to clear a little bit around their houses and whatever. So it's, it's, you've got to be a little bit, give and take. A little yeah, bit yeah. of give and take, yeah. but it's probably cut down by 90% of what we were seeing. You were as likely to find Mark on the ground as you were in the air flying a helicopter. And during the week we were in the conception, we joined Mark and the rest of the team to replace collars on lions from their original reintroduction and also place new collars on some of the next generation which had been born here. Despite successfully locating the right animal, as quickly as she had been spotted, she disappeared into cover. And despite at least half an hour trying to relocate her, we never did. However, earlier that morning, Tyler had joined Mary Cabela on a successful attempt. We knew about the 24 Lions project, but we had no idea the, the vastness of this project. And to get to um, come here now and, and to be in the helicopter with you when we darted that first, one of the first lion cubs yeah born here. That was amazing. That was, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. If, for me, too, it yeah. was amazing. It's, a, it's all amazing, though. It's, it's just, Dan, Ivan went to Dan. They all go through Dan. Sure. They went to Dan and talked to him about doing something. And uh, Dan came to me and they said, okay, here's a list of animals. Uh, would you like to uh, participate in that and I said oh I'd love to then they wanted me to pick out which animal and of course it was a lion so it just evolved and it took a long time to evolve, evolve to the point where we could do it and uh, get the permits and then we were doing going to do Zimbabwe bring the lions from Zimbabwe but then it fell through everything fell through they they per uh, granted the permits, and then they took the permits back. So uh, we weren't able to do that. And so it took several years before we were able to do it. We will hear more about the 24 Lions project in the next episode, where we witness the recollaring of a male lion which had previously been a problem animal, killing cattle in local villages. You will also join us under the cover of darkness to tranquilize a leopard. To see more on this story, check out Modern Huntsman on social media, or head over to the website, www.modernhuntsman.com, where you can read about this and many more stories on African conservation in volume eight. <laughs>